This is International Master Eric Kislik, and today we're going to be discussing counting and essentially what I mean by that is how we count in a complicated calculation. And that's one of those things which I think a lot of people avoid discussing because it's very difficult to give advice on. And uh, pretty much the only advice I can recall seeing is something like, well, just count the pieces on every move. And personally, I found that to be ineffective because basically what that ends up being for a lot of players is just a counting of, of arithmetic. And a lot of the time that becomes approximate counting and becomes very, very misleading. Let me give you an example. So let's say you calculate a variation and you think, okay, so I'm plus three. Okay, plus three again. Okay, plus three again, and I'm giving up my queen. And you're relying on old piece values. For instance, a knight is worth three, a bishop is worth three, the queen is worth 10. And you go, oh, no, no, I shouldn't go for that because then I'm losing one point. But in actuality, three minor pieces are worth more than a queen. And what's even more complicated is, let's say you're, you're using more accurate piece values, the the um, Larry Kaufman piece values, which were published in, in multiple um, sources that he, that he published. And what happens if you, you try to use numbers like 3.5 to calculate? It, it starts to get very complicated. And I think that you'd be surprised how you can actually work through some really, really difficult calculations. The hard part, I think, is the calculation part. The part of actually counting I think can be done in a reasonable manner. And somebody asked me about this game, Mamadyarov Nakamura, which was played today in St. Louis in the Rapid Tournament. And Mamadyarov made a really, really interesting sacrifice. I, I almost have to wonder if this was prepared in some way because it was, it was very impressive. I, I was uh, really shocked by the depth of it, but it may have just been very, very good judgment. Um, and also it may have been that he just didn't have many other options. But in this position, Mamadyarov played the move queen takes e8 check. So I'll play through the moves first, and then I'll talk about it, and I'll talk about how I would go about counting, and why I wouldn't go about just counting on every move. Oh, I'm, I'm minus five now, or I'm plus three now. I think that just, just simply gets too confusing. It costs too much time. It misleads you and it basically pulls you in the wrong direction without benefiting you. So anyway, I'll, I'll play through the moves that were played. Queen takes e8 check, rook takes e8, d takes c6, bishop takes c1, bishop to e5, attacking the queen on b8, rook takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop to a6, Rook to d7, bishop to g5, c7, and quite an amazing finish here. Queen to c8. We're going to go back to the game in a second, um, the, the earlier position in the game. Bishop f6, check. King to f8, bishop e6 with the threat of rook f7, check. King e8, check. And they had a, a rather amazing draw here. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of analyzing this because this was a very, very complicated, a complicated sacrifice and very complicated line. But what I do want to talk about is how you would how you would even go about counting that original line. So if we go back all the way to here. So basically, what you have to realize when you're counting th through a variation like this is you just have to basically think about what are you trading off what is actually being exchanged here. So oftentimes what you're going to notice is that very common exchanges are taking place. So for instance, after queen takes e8 check, I'm going to talk about it without moving the pieces. So after queen takes e8 check, rook takes e8, d takes c6, in principle we have a pretty common exchange that has occurred here. We've traded a queen for a rook and a minor piece and we've obtained a passed pawn on c6. Although the complicated part is what happens after the move bishop to c1, bishop takes c1. So what happens there is if we realize all of this, we've traded 
we traded our queen for a rook and knight, which is a fairly common exchange. And now they've actually just taken a rook. So what we have here is we only actually have a minor piece for the queen. So we need to, we need to act pretty quickly to prove that we have something. And the next move that was played was bishop to e5. And black played rook takes e5, knight takes e5. So essentially what happened was we went from a position where we only had a piece to where the opponent gave up the exchange. So now, rather than having a piece, we have a rook. So we have, we have a rook for the, for the opponent's queen, and we also have a very strong pass pawn. So see how this plays out, and, and think about this. And this is one definitely worth exploring. I think in most other cases, just simply being aware of what the essential exchanges are that are taking place is gonna help you more than any other system of counting. So queen takes e8, rook takes e8, d takes c6, bishop takes c1. So notice we have very little material at the moment for the queen. Bishop to e5, rook takes e5 was played, and then knight takes e5. And, and, and by the way, I just want to mention that if the queen moved, we would play take, take, take. And here we have three minor pieces for the queen. So this isn't going to be too bad for white. And this is presumably what Mama Jarov was, was counting on with his calculation. So rook takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop to a6. And this was really, really interesting because one of the points is that the knight is undefended, but also the bishop on c1 is undefended. But when we go rook to d7, the e5 knight is not loose because of the back rank for black. So black is not able to take that e5 knight so at the moment we only have really we only have a rook for the queen but the dominance is so strong effectively the the pawn on c7 becomes so powerful that with the other domination that white has he's able to draw the position so it was really a, a quite amazing case of effectively sacrificing the queen for only a rook but having pure domination and having a very strong pass pawn as compensation. But the hardest part, I think, in that entire calculation, not only, of course, recognizing what the compensation was, but just sort of navigating through that whole aspect of, of counting. So bishop to g5, I'll just play through this again. c7, queen to c8, bishop to d5, bishop to f6, Bishop takes f7 check, king f8, and then they had a draw after this. So a, a really amazing way to end a draw <laughs> in, a, in a rapid game, in a, in a real rated game. So quite amazing stuff by both players and really, really difficult to navigate this kind of position in a practical game. So very impressive achievement by both players. I, I really enjoyed that one. So I want to show an example from my own play which is a bit different, but in which I effectively navigated through a very complicated position with the exact type of thinking. And it was one of those positions in which I think that if you tried to count any other way, any other reasonable way I could think of, it would be far more confusing and you would be much more likely to simply lose your way or, or get confused or basically maybe even think you're down a large amount of material when you're not. So effectively, I had this position, and let's just count the material before anything else. Um, at the moment, I have four pawns on the queen side. The opponent has two. So I'm up two pawns at the moment. My rook on e3 is attacked by their knight, and I see that the bishop on c8 is defending the g4 knight and also defending the b7 pawn. So I was calculating, well, there are, some, there are a couple of problems here. One is that if I move my rook, my opponent can play, let's say, bishop takes c3 and bring their queen out to h4 when I have some problems with the f2 pawn or the h2 pawn. So there's some tactical issues if, my, if I move my rook. But I was thinking, well, maybe I can work my, my way through this by playing c takes b7. And I was trying to figure out how to, how to accurately calculate this. 
and the way to the way to navigate through these exchanges is just to simply realize what is being exchanged and the simplest way to, to do that in this case is we I mean the main thing we, we need to realize are are the the biggest um, amounts of material being exchanged so if I go C takes B7 they play Knight takes E3 I play B takes A8 Queen giving myself a new Queen and capturing the Rook and they play Knight takes D1 let's pause for a moment and try to think about how the counting works there was that in my favor, or was that a bad exchange? What do you think? Let's, let's pause for a moment and think about that. So if I play C takes B7 and I, I end up taking the rook, what I'm doing is I will be giving up a rook and my queen and actually what I'm getting is I'm getting a rook and I'm getting a new queen. <laughs> so actually it's an equal trade of material. And I think this is a very good example of a case in which if you just simply try to, try to count on every move, you might easily get lost. And that's also why I don't recommend counting on every single move. I recommend looking at what exactly is happening in the whole sequence because it's much easier to map what's going on that way. And so in this case, we have a much easier time actually counting it that way when we just realize, well, actually, material, material that's being exchanged here is equal. So, um, so in the game, I, I realized that, that the exchange of material there was, was actually equal and I played C takes B7 my opponent when knight takes e3 and my impression was that my opponent was was very confused in trying to navigate through this probably didn't have a, a clear idea on on exactly what the evaluation was going to be if this was going to be good for him or bad for him I kinda of think he was going mainly for complications so I played b takes a8 queen and it's especially complicated when you get a new queen because you also have to realize that you're effectively giving up a pawn and we've essentially just traded pawns. I traded the c6 pawn for the b7 pawn. And so now my opponent played knight takes d1. And again, I realized that we just have a trade of knights if I play knight takes d1 and they go queen takes d4. So I played the move knight takes d1 and they went queen takes d4. And it, it may have seemed alarming, but uh, in advance I'd seen that I have the move bishop to b2 which defends both my undefended knight on d1 and my undefended rook on a1. So I simply played bishop to b2, and this was one of the positions that was in my calculation. And I realized, well, I have this position here, and I've, I've survived all the tactics, and I have an extra pawn. Yes, my opponent does have the bishop pair as some form of, of pretty good compensation, but I'm, I'm up a pawn, so I'm up a, a past C pawn, and I'm able to bring my queen back to the D5 or E4 square, depending on where he moves his queen. So I was pretty happy about that, and I played the move queen to E4, and my opponent made a, a big mistake on the next move and fell for this shot of bishop takes G7, which he can't take with the king because of knight F5 check, picking up the undefended queen on E2. So... Um, so this, this, I think, was a game that was mostly decided by navigating my way through a complicated position by really just counting the pieces um, accurately when there was a very complicated, a very complicated combination that, that occurred. And I basically just realized that I'm not losing any material in the exchange, and what's happening is that things are getting simplified. And... Basically, once the rubble clears, the position isn't bad for me. So I'm just going to go back to that position one more time, just so you can see it again. And I want you to think about how you think the best way to count through a position like this is. So I played c takes b7, knight takes e3, b takes a8 queen, knight takes d1. And basically, I realized I'm still up these two, these two isolated c pawns. So my opponent took, took, bishop e2, and I'm, I'm still up a pawn. So all of these exchanges didn't really hurt me. 
And of course, there were some improvements for, for both sides in that, in that line. I'm not going to get into those types of specifics because the emphasis here was really just on counting. It wasn't on an exact analysis of the position. Just like in the previous game uh, played by Mamadirov against um, Nakamura. So really, I think that what you want to do is you want to deepen your understanding of, of how you want to work through these complicated positions. And either either try to follow this as closely as you can, or at least use this video as a way to deepen your own understanding of how you would like to work through complicated cases like this, because this is the exact reason why we play games and analyze games and think about chess, because we want to deepen our grasp of things that we maybe just hadn't thought about that deeply before, or maybe hadn't thought about that logically before. So I found that this, that this method has been by far the simplest way of working through complicated positions. And it's not really even a method per se, it's mostly about awareness and realization. And in a case like this, if you just realize that equal material is being exchanged, you don't actually have to kind of sweat over, oh, am I plus three, am I minus three, am I plus six, am I minus two? That just becomes way too complicated. So here, we're relying on general awareness and having a general idea of what exactly was exchanged, relying on the most simple type of exchange that occurs first and building off of that. So hopefully this was valuable for you and consider subscribing. Thanks.